Hello and welcome to Local Image for April. I'm Judy Skyvoss. Is your yard in need of some major maintenance? Are your shrubs screaming for a makeover? Did beetles make unwanted lace out of your plant leaves last summer? Well, today's first segment brings answers to these questions and more as we visit with a lawn and garden expert. I'm here at Bachman's and I have with me Susie Bachman. Hi, Hi. how are you doing today? Good, great, thank you. Tell us a little bit about Bachman's. How long has the uh, business been in operation? Bachman's started in 1885 when wow. my uh, great, great grandfather came over here from Germany with his new bride and uh, they started a vegetable business in Richfield. Okay. And uh, the business has evolved through the generations to floral gift and garden business that mm -hmm. it is today. It's still completely family owned and uh, we love being in this business yeah. and all that it has to bring. Well I have a lot of questions for you today and I might be a little all over the map because I just I'm going to be overwhelmed this season no, trying to get my fun. lawn and garden ready. But my first question is the snow, you know, melting, melting away, leaving not such a pretty lawn underneath. How no. do we kind of, yeah. what's some of the things that we can do to get that lawn up and running well? Lawns are not going to be pretty once all that snow goes away, primarily because the ground had not frozen before all of our snow came. Okay. And we had a considerable amount of snow Absolutely. this season. So when all that snow goes, you're going to probably see some disease or uh, snow mold is a typical one where you'll see gray or pink patches yep. in your lawn. Do not fear. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, the best thing to do is wait. Okay. And that is the hardest thing. But you want to wait until that ground is, has absorbed the water and the frost has come out of the ground. Okay. Then you'll want to go with a rake and you'll want to use um, a, a flexible rake, so yep. either one that has metal tines All on right. it that's quite flexible or a poly rake. All right. And you'll just want to rake gently those affected areas. Get up the trampled dead grass and any sand or anything that has accumulated salt that has accumulated yes. in the area. Now rake extremely gently because new grass Don't is pull that coming up, up okay. and overzealous raking can, yes, I've can done do quite it. a bit of damage. <laughs> Once I am able to rake it up, what can I do to you know, help fortify yeah. that lawn? Okay, so once you've raked up the dead grass and the sand from that area, if you have bare ground, you'll want to put some nice black dirt or soil okay. in the area. Or if you have good soil there, just make sure it's tilled up considerably. Okay. And then in a boulevard or a place that you have uh, a lot of salt or along the street, you'll want to use a boulevard grass seed mix. Okay. Now in your lawn, where you have had maybe your snow mold or disease yes. problems, then you'll probably want to either use a bluegrass or a fescue or some combination thereof, depending on what type of grass you already have so it matches. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about our gardens and kind of getting them ready for planting and, um, you know, they've taken a toll over this yeah. long winter also and then along with that um, things like hostas that are overgrown what what are some what things to do with them? yeah okay so it depends on how you've left your garden in the fall some people tend to prune all their perennials back and okay. others uh, leave them I tend to leave mine it helps protect the crown of the plant a little okay. bit so then you need to go in there and again gently rake especially uh, with like a small shrub rake so you can get in between different plants or perennials and remove that yeah. material on top so you just have nice uh, black dirt and some of your perennials will be poking through right right it's so fun to see them yeah then after the plant has emerge so you can see the entire plant but it probably hasn't filled out okay. in its entirety if you would like to divide them that is the time so the easiest way is just to dig up the entire plant the biggest thing is go deep always go deeper okay. than you think so you get the entire root ball of that plant then bring it up to the surface and the best tool will be a square 
which what we call a square point shovel or a garden spade. Okay. And you can just chop that plant in half. And don't feel don't like worry you're doing about any, it, huh? any damage to it, especially it those pastas it. or, or <laughs> day lilies. You can just cut it in half or in thirds or quarters. You'll see a natural break line right. when you pull that plant up. And then immediately plant all the different sections of it and keep it well watered. One of the things that happened in my garden this past summer was the lace effect that took place on some of my new plants that I planted, their leaves, from this beetle infestation. The Japanese beetle. The yeah. Japanese beetle uh, is a significant problem. It's real patchy in the Twin Cities. It okay. tends to be quite bad in this area, unfortunately. Uh, yes. And there are things that you can do. The Japanese beetle starts in a grub form before it matures into its beetle form. Okay. So you can start by putting a grub control for Japanese beetles on your ground. And All you would right. want to do this first thing in the, in the spring. So, yes, um, good to know. When the grubs are starting to come to the top of the surface, there are things that you can do once you see the beetles and even though you've put this down it's not a foolproof method that you've right. gotten all of them because they'll fly from your neighbor's yard. Yes um, they will. But there are traps and um, the thing with the traps is the beetles do release a pheromone and that pheromone actually attracts, attracts more, more oh. beetles <laughs> but you just have to keep emptying the bag. Okay uh, so it's just a pest that we have to deal with. It's a pest There's you no have to deal with and is a last resort if your you know prize rose yes. shrub just is covered with them you can use an insecticide to spray on that and that will kill the beetle on contact. Okay. How about trees and bushes at this time of the year? Is this the time when we start to trim or? Pruning is a very typical question. There's uh, a lot of unknowns yeah. I think people know about pruning. And um, pruning in the spring, you need to do it very early in the spring. Actually, before the plants have come out of dormancy oh, okay. would be the best time to prune. Um, you certainly do not want to prune anything once it has completely leafed out and emerged. Oh, the plant okay. used all of its energy to leaf out and if you would prune it, it doesn't have a lot of stored up nutrients and energy to heal those wounds okay. from the pruning. Good so if you want to get out in your yard mm. now, prune. Yes, this <laughs> because is now good, is a good. This is something we can do. This is something that you can do patient. right now. Excellent. And when you prune, you yeah. want to make sure that you use a pruner okay. with a nice sharp blade on it. Um, clean cuts. Clean cuts. You typically want to cut at an angle, and always make sure the cutting blade is on top. Don't oh, have the cutting blade underneath. Okay. You'll get a much cleaner cut okay. if it's on top. And um, you can prune pretty much anything except something that blooms first thing in the spring. Like azaleas. Azaleas, rhododendrons, lilacs. Those you don't want to prune because the buds already, are already okay, set. They yeah. bud on the old wood. So if you would prune it, the plant won't flower this Got season because you. you'll Got prune you. them off. Yeah. The other thing that you don't want to prune even this time of year is elms or oaks. Okay. And that is because of Dutch elm disease and oak wilt. Those really need to be pruned in December and January oh my goodness. and February. You need to get out there we in your snow that suit one this year. Okay. And, and prune those. Well, Susie Bachman, thank you so much for these great yeah. tips. It really, a, a lot of these questions are about my own lawn, <laughs> and I'm sure I sh you know, share those issues with a lot of people out there. So thank you so yeah. much for all thank the great you. info. And again, if people want more, there's Bachman's.com. Bachman's.com, or feel free to... Uh, Call any of our stores, we're here to help. Exactly right. Let's stick with the spring theme and focus even more on going green as we find out all about the upcoming Rite of Spring event happening at the end of April. This is the fifth annual event sponsored by the City of Matamidi and the second year of involvement with Century College where the event is being hosted on April 30th. And joining me today to share all the details are Pamela Tinnitsen with Century College and Marnie McInnes of the City of Matamidi Green Corps. Welcome ladies. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about the Rite of Spring, because I know we've covered that in the past on some of our shows here. That's been around, obviously, for five years, but now there's this added dimension 
Um, so tell us a little bit of how that came to be. Right. Uh, the Rite of Spring initially started with community education and Mary George, who really spearheaded the event. And so it originally was held at the community education building, kind of grew, and then moved to the high school. And now we started to um, try to expand to a different element and have it with Century College this year. So we're really excited okay. about that. And that specific part of the event is the Greener Living Fair, is that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, in 2007, our college president signed a climate commitment, and it's a national movement to help for colleges and universities kind of lead the change towards renewable energy okay. and, and lowering pollution that causes climate change and so on. And last year, as part of that, to, to educate the community and the students, we started what's called the Greener Living Fair. And in June, we met with the city of Matamidi folks to collaborate the two events and um, put the event on at Century College. So. Okay, so what what were some of the things that the Rite of Spring were presenting to folks in the past years? They try to get the community really involved in it and hands-on activities. They have um, make and take cleansers for your home that you can make and take home with you. Um, they have a lot of events geared towards kids where they'll have environmental education. People come out and bring animals and such to get um, kids really interested in the environment as well. Okay, and so how does that pair nicely then with the greener living and what's happening through Century College? What are some of the things going on there? Well, one example with the greener cleaners is um, there's some 80,000 toxic chemicals that are in our everyday products and by law the companies don't even have to put all those ingredients on the label. And we've been uh, promoting at our fair renewable energy, particularly solar, also wind. Um, the Montemita Area Green Initiative will be at the fair again, um, and they're doing fundraising for a wind um, the turbine. wind turbine, yes. Is that for wind project? And we'll have a garden club and a gardening uh, company. Oh, we also have Will Steger speaking nice. that morning in Very the gymnasium cool. mm -hmm. at 10 a.m. Um, I'm sorry, Will Steger's speaking in a theater. Okay. The fair is in the gymnasium, yes. both on the west side of campus. Will Steger's speaking at 10. The fair starts at 10.30, okay. and we're going till 2. So a nice kickoff with Will doing a presentation right at the beginning, and then it goes right into being able to kind of walk around and meet with some of these different mm -hmm. pre presenters and vendors and whatever. And we'll have food. We've got well, people important. helping with Coffee Cottage. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the River Market Co-op in Stillwater is also going to be having their food and information about their co-op too. So. Okay. Why should we care? I mean, why is this important to our communities or should it be important to our communities? The more we become aware of what our individual impact is, the more we can make an individual impact for the better. And, and so we're hoping to increase awareness. Um, for students and community members right. about about the problems um, as a result of human activities. <laughs> you can make a big impact by doing some small right. things. We just have to start one person at a time and try to build it. And the, the event will hopefully bring more people together to work together towards okay. that. All right. And if there's anyone um, who has a green idea, whether it's a green product to sell, green things to give away, Good point. Um, be sure to contact one of us. We'd be happy to send out a reservation sure. form to be a vendor. Where, a where should they contact you? Oh, let's see. <laughs> there's a reservation <laughs> form on the City of Matamidai's website. Okay. So if you'll be on their main page on the website, there'll be a Rite of Spring link. You can cr click on it and there'll be a vendor registration form document on there. So Thanks for coming on today and best wishes with that event. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm excited. Besides <laughs> all things spring related, April is also National Poetry Month. Producer Scott Jensen shares a story with a poetic touch in this local image segment. People ask, ask me, you know, was it a good trip? And I said, it couldn't have been better. Okay. Um, you remember when we were leaving the airport from Amsterdam and I said, I should want to go home more, but I'd rather just Good keep going. traveling. It was, it was just such a good time. Well, I've been telling this story to groups uh, for the last um, 32 years. And it's a story of my birth in Latvia uh, during very difficult times because the Nazis were in control and Russia was soon to invade and we escaped to Germany and lived in a refugee camp for five years and uh, 
I think the painful thing for mom uh, was that she didn't know what, where my dad was. And for three years, every day she went to the local Red Cross headquarters to see if they got his name on any of their lists, and they did not. At the end of that three-year period, she received a letter from a mutual friend of my dad's and hers, and he described how he saw dad shot by the Russians. So then mom knew her search was over, and she had to plan to find a home for herself and her kids. My brother told us the name of the area that we lived in, and the area was called Sarkandaugava, and we were able to find Sarkandaugava through some help by a Latvian lady who I don't think would have even talked to us, but when Cal said to her, this is my wife, Sarmita Sarmita Dintra Priyada, and it was like magic. She just had the biggest smile on her face, and she says, that's Latvian. Latvian, and I would say, Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sarmita, my mom made up from Sarma, which is frost. I was born in December, but she wanted to soften it, so she made it Sarmita. And my middle name, Zintra, means amber. And uh, Latvia is known as Zintra Zeme, Zintra land, or amber land. And Priade is pine, pine tree, the very uh, sap that uh, amber comes from is the pine tree. So you can't get more Latvian than that. <laughs> <laughs> and the little church that our family attended was there. He told me it was Trinity Lutheran Church. And we walked in and asked if someone spoke English. And a lady came up to us who introduced herself as the church evangelist, meaning the pastor. And uh, Cal told her briefly about my story and asked, does, your, does the church keep old records? of baptisms. And she says, yes, down at the church office. And she opened this large leather volume. And I very clearly saw Sarmita Zintra Priyade. That's me. <laughs> she was standing when she saw it. And she kind of slumped into a chair. And Lauma, the woman that found it for us, looked at me and she said, she is happy? And I said, she is happy, yes. At four months of age, my dad carried me into this, this church. And it was the first time my whole life I felt a connection to my dad. Because mom t told me that how much he loved me. She said she, he would have spoiled you if he'd lived. Uh, but uh, that just gave me such a reality about my dad and his caring for me. And uh, it was a very important moment for me. As we were leaving, uh, Latvia, flying out of, out of there, I was uh, just really overcome by all that we had seen and what I felt were miracles that had taken place and how meaningful it was for me to see Sarmeda in her homeland and uh, to have enjoyed all the things that we did. And I thought I need to write some of this down. So I started on a poem for her and uh, I wrote, Wings lift us up from land blood soiled, where her father died, her mother toiled. I sit and wonder beside her now that God in mercy would somehow lead us to those special places where we saw on smiling faces pure delight when they heard her name. That's Latvian, they said, all the same. Their faces were much younger when carried to church, her father then brought her forward in holy array to be baptized on that day. The years have passed, four score and seven, and I believe someday in heaven, when she sits at Jesus' feet, her earthly father she'll also meet. Oh, what joy will fill their hearts, sorrow's gone, eternity starts, then begins eternal life for me and my friend, my love, my wife.
write the date of April 16th down on your to-do list and hope that you see this show before it passes because you won't want to miss the first Antique and Art Fair sponsored by the 916 Education Foundation. It's an event packed with activities for everyone, including the chance to have your antique or collectible evaluated by a local dealer. Here to tell us more are Lisa Beecroft, Executive Director for the 916 Education Foundation, Shelly Mathis, an active volunteer with the foundation, and her daughter, Miss White Bear Lake International, Amanda Mathis, who is also a volunteer with the organization. Welcome to you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. We have royalty among us. That's pretty exciting. <laughs> Congratulations. I understand you just recently were crowned. Yes, I actually competed at the Miss Minnesota in la level, and it was very exciting. I got to meet a lot of fun girls, and it was a fabulous weekend. So we're, what happens next in, in terms of your competition then? Competing, again, for the state level. So hopefully next time you see me, maybe I'll have a bigger crown Excellent. and the Miss Minnesota on my sash. Well, we'll have to get you back when you have that bigger crown. Mm -hmm, definitely. So good luck with that. Let's talk more about this event that's coming up. It sounds like a really fun event. And it's the first time you've ever done something like this, as I understand, as kind of a fundraiser for the uh, foundation. How did this event come about? What, where did the idea spring from? Well, the foundation's been around for 26 years, and it has some very successful fundraisers, a golf event, an annual gala, of course, a membership drive. And last summer, a bunch of volunteers got together, and Shelley was at the meeting, and we were brainstorming what could we do that's different that would also outreach to students and to the community. Okay. And so as we were coming up with ideas, she mentioned, you know, I don't know that anyone has done anything with antiques in the area, at least not recently. Yeah. So the idea started there and really blossomed into quite a large event. It sounds like a lot of fun. Is it a lot of work to try and coordinate something like this? It is, because there are actually about four or five things that are going to be happening at the same time that day. We wanted to make this an event that appealed to a lot of different people. Okay. So we certainly have antique appraisals where we have different dealers representing either general antiques or sports collectibles, coins, okay. artwork, different things like that. But while we were planning this, we thought, well, you know, what if somebody really isn't into antiques that much? From that came the student art fair, okay. so there will be students displaying their art from the 916 school district. Um, they will be displaying it. Some of them will also be selling it um, for a creative Mother's Day gift. And then we added in an, ant uh, an arts and antique boutique as well. Very and cool. local um, handcrafted goods, um, antiques, collectibles will be on sale for, again, that unique Mother's Day gift that everybody can enjoy. Very fun. Uh, the other two things that are happening, White Bear Center for the Arts is going to be giving free drawing lessons, lessons for all ages and abilities. And then uh, 15 junior high students at 916 in one of the special education programs made a handcrafted canoe. They'll be displaying it and raffling it off um, at the Very event as well. Very cool. Lots going on mm -hmm. in this event. And I want to find out more about 916 and kind mm -hmm. of, you know, who that all serves. But tell me first, Shelley, why you volunteer, how you kind of came to want to volunteer for this organization and, and your daughter as well, Shelley. <laughs> Well, we actually have worked with Lisa in the past and other events involved in the White Bear Lake community. And then Lisa contacted us, I don't know, was it last fall? Mm -hmm. And said that she had gone on to a new position and asked if we had any interest in, in volunteering. And we were more than happy to say yes because I have a nephew who is, um, was diagnosed with high-functioning autism. Amanda has, her platform is autism awareness and the benefit is just huge and it's for kids. Yep. How does the money then help the foundation and who is this really serving, this, mm -hmm. this Northeast Metro School District and the right. foundation? Um, Northeast Metro 916 is an intermediate school district and it serves 10 member districts including White Bear Lake, Montemedi, North St. Paul, Maplewood, Roseville, all the way out to Stillwater, okay. Southern Washington County, and, and it goes on. Large area. Uh, it's a large area, and it's, an, it's a public school district, but it provides more than 150 educational services and programs to different areas. Uh, okay. Special education is a large component, um, but there is also career and technical education for high school students that's offered at Century College. There's an elementary school that's run out in Woodbury. So more than 4,000 some students are impacted by the district. What the foundation does is we're uh, an independent nonprofit, mm -hmm. a charitable organization that raises money for program grants and student scholarships. 
with special education. We help put in um, money for program grants to buy specialized equipment, mm -hmm. um, different rooms um, such as sensory rooms for students with autism, anywhere where we can help make a difference in the district. And last year we were able to give back about $70,000. Wow. Um, but we have higher aspirations than that. Our hope is to continue to grow and get back more each year. Okay, very cool. And obviously you, your family has experienced uh, the programs firsthand. Mm -hmm. how, how has this really helped in terms of like your nephew who has autism? Well, we were just talking about that on the way over here. Um, if you know a little bit about autism, autism has, there's some social components right. with the disorder. And uh, Nicholas has some difficulty with um, the winning and losing concept okay. <laughs> and being a friend. And so they uh, have a, have somehow put together or designed a program for him. So like with the issue with games, with winning and losing, he has a special gym time and he's allowed to ask a couple of friends to go with him. Mm -hmm. And then they do play games for the physical exercise, but they're not a winning losing game. Okay. They're a game where they just play and have fun and get that exercise. But it's it's been fun because the kids that he gets to pick, he could pick whoever yeah. he wants from the class. And so he's been able to develop new friendships now. That's been one component. Makes a difference. Um, what do you think? The reading program? The reading program is really good. I read with him when he ever comes over because he's had milestones with reading and learning. He loves working with math with me because math's one of my favorite subjects. So I always sit down and help him with his homework because that extra one-on-one -on -one time is just really good right. because he's interacting with me. Yeah. You know, we work on the eye contact and speaking to me and not looking away at me. So definitely his teachers have been very phenomenal. So obviously funding to help pay for some of these specialized types of programs and teachers that work with students like mm -hmm. your nephew mm -hmm. are key and there's and it does benefit so many in our communities. So what are some of your goals going forward then for the foundation? Uh, it, we also want to continue to help the district become more recognized as a great asset in our community. Sometimes it's a service that's taken for granted and yeah. uh, the foundation will succeed if people understand better what the district is able to do and, and how it really contributes to uh, education. And so to reach some of those goals, at least uh, financially, it's very important that people come out to this fun event. Some mm -hmm. other highlights that you want to point to for the event this year? Um, for this event, again, Mother's Day is just around the corner after this event, so if you're looking for a creative gift, something that you're not going to find at the mall, um, come out and get an artwork from a student Great, or yeah. from one of our local artists. Uh, you're not only supporting people in the area, but you're also getting a, a gift that nobody else can give. And as far as the antique appraisal, there is mm -hmm. a nominal fee depending on what you want right. to bring in. Is that right? Right. And uh, basically anywhere from a dollar to ten dollars an item depending on the item. And right. um, part of that is because some people might want to bring in a chair and somebody might want to bring in an antique coin. So sure. um, it's a small fee, but everything goes towards um, the proceeds for the, uh, the foundation, which will in turn then be given to the district. And again, the date is April April 16th. 16th. It's a Saturday. It's at White Bear South Campus, the high school over on McKnight. And the event is going to run from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, lots of fun things that will be going on throughout that uh, entire period of time. Thanks for coming on, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you there. Okay. Thank you. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. Don't miss the first Antique and Art Fair sponsored by the 916 Education Foundation on April 16th. And then join me again in May for more great local stories. Until then, happy Easter. And as always, I thank you for watching Local Image. <laughs>